Okay, uh, welcome to the lecture here. Uh, continuing on in chapter 14, I think it is. So we get started here in just a sec, continuing on where we left off from chapter 14. Just a couple of things here. Okay, uh, so we've been talking about um, talking about a lot of things in this chapter. We talked about acids and bases. Uh, we talked about pH. Uh, we talked about um, weak acids, weak bases. We also talked about salts and hydrolysis. And um, at the end last time, we started talking about the idea of a common ion effect. Uh, common ion effect, as we'll talk about today, is really uh, what are referred to as buffers. Um, but there are cases where we do have uh, something like a weak acid or a weak base that is set up in equilibrium. And in that equilibrium, we also have an ion that is part of that equilibrium, also added to the solution. And based on Le Chatelier's principle, it's basically going to cause either that weak acid or weak base basically to stay together uh, more and not really break apart. And because it stays together more and doesn't break apart, it's not able to produce as much, say, H plus in the case of a weak acid, uh, not as much OH minus in the case of a weak base, and thus um, basically keeps it together. And it has an effect on the pH because of that. Um, we saw some formulas that you can use uh, to solve sort of common ion problems. Um, and you really can approach those sort of two ways. You can do it uh, based on an ice table like we've done before. So you can kind of set up an ice table. Uh, so here's an example I think that we finished up on uh, last time. So if you want to take the ice table approach, you want to make sure you set up the equilibrium for either the weak acid or weak base, whichever one obviously is going to sort of set up that equilibrium. And the important part of sort of the ice table approach and the part where people mess up the most on, as we talked about last time, is in this initial part of it. And in the initial part, you definitely do have, for example, in this case, uh, the concentration of that weak acid. You have zero of the H plus. And here, though, because we do have that common ion, as we talked about last time, you do have an initial concentration, in this case, of, of the formate. And that's something that people kind of always screw up on. They put zero there. And as we talked about last time, if you do put zero there on the initial part of that table, uh, you're essentially not doing a common ion problem or really a buffer problem. Uh, you're doing just a weak acid problem and you will get you know, the wrong answer. And that initial part's important because that's really what's gonna cause that whole Le Chatelier's principle uh, to push that equilibrium back the other way. and prevent a lot more H plus from coming off. So you could go through this ice table like we talked about all the way through. You could assume X is equal to zero, solve it uh, that way, or use the quadratic formula or anything like that. The other way that you could go about sort of solving these problems is using the henderson hasselbalch equation, which is down here. And that is the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. And the reason you could do that is because of what we're talking about here, because there's really sort of a suppression of the weak acid or weak base from breaking apart. Um, what you start with in terms of it's a concentration, initial concentrations, ends up being in a lot of cases pretty much the same as the equilibrium concentration for both, in this case, for example, our weak acid and conjugate base. And what that means is in those situations, which is pretty much most of the situations you come across, you can actually go directly into this equation to calculate the pKa, as we talked about, that is minus the log of the Ka value. And uh, you take the base over the acid and that will give you the pH. So if you did an ice table approach correctly, 
if you use the Henderson Hasselbach equation correctly, you should really end up with the exact same answer. So it is sort of a, a personal preference for these problems, which way you want to do it. Um, the Henderson Hasselbach way probably would be a much quicker sort of way of solving these type of problems. Uh, but again, you don't have to necessarily do it that way. Um, you can definitely do it the ice table way. So um, sometimes people do it the ice table way. Sometimes people use the Henderson Hasselbach equation. One thing that we talked about last time as well that's really important is you don't want to use the Henderson Hasselbach equation in every situation. So it is not like uh, for every situation. It's not for every situation where you have, say, two numbers or something like that. It's for specific situations which are really common ion problems or really buffer problems. And if it's not really a common ion or a buffer type problem, you should not be using Henderson Hasselbach. That's the other very common error that people make uh, in these problems is they go, oh, cool, I got two numbers. I'm just going to keep throwing it into that formula on every single problem, even if it's not that type of problem. So um, we talked about that it's important to try to understand what's going on in these problems so that you can kind of correctly do the math. Uh, so that's really important, again, especially in these type of problems. Um, in addition, we, we talked about sort of an alternative sort of Henderson Hasselbach equation that is sometimes used for sort of basic situations. And again, just to remind you on that, that was uh, the pOH is equal to the pKB plus the log of the acid over the base. So it's a little bit different than the traditional Henderson Hasselbach equation, as we talked about last time. Henderson Hasselbach gives you the pH directly. This does not give you the pH, it gives you the pOH. Also, you need the pKB because it's basic and it's acid over base instead of the base over acid. So very different equation. Um, pKB here found the same way as pKA. It's uh, minus the log of the KB value. And a nice relationship that we talked about, pKA plus pKB equals 14. So there's a couple of few other equations are used. As I mentioned last time, personally speaking, I would just stick with the Henderson Hasselbach equation uh, again. And because most of the time uh, you really ask for the pH of the solution, very rarely in sort of a buffer situation, would you be asked, uh, you know, what's the pOH or something like that. If you use the pOH version of the equation, you still usually in most cases then need to subtract 14 to get yourself to the pH. So, I mean, if you're going to go and try to get the pH, you might as well just use the Henderson Hasselbach equation that actually gives you the pH value right off the bat. But again, you'll, I don't know if your book uses this equation very much or not. I can't remember. But um, again, you'll sometimes see people use it more for basic sort of situations. But again, you can use the Henderson Hasselbach for acidic, basic, or neutral situations. It really doesn't matter. The important part is as long as you get the base over the acid in that one and you're using a pKa value, you know, you should be okay. Any questions on any of that stuff uh, that we talked about, I think, last time? Okay. So we've been talking about sort of common ions and that it's really um, a buffer problem. So let's officially sort of talk about, you know, what a buffer is. And a buffer is a solution that contains either a weak acid or a weak base and the salt of its conjugate acid or conjugate base. So those are really the two parts to a buffer. It's either a weak acid and its conjugate base or you can make a buffer out of a weak base and is conjugate acid. And if you remember, these are two things that are essentially related to each other by one H plus difference. And it's sometimes referred to as the salt of his conjugate base or the salt of his conjugate acid. And that's because they will typically contain a spectator ion, like a sodium, a potassium, lithium, something in there. And a buffer needs to have both of those things in the solution to start with. So both of those things do have to be present in the solution to start with in order for you to have a buffer. And what a buffer can do is a buffer can resist the ability 
to change pH, even if you add small amounts of acid or base to it. So first off, most people uh, kind of screw up on the buffer definition. A buffer is not necessarily a neutral solution. So a buffer can be neutral. A buffer could also be acidic or basic. So you could have a buffer that is any pH. You could actually make a buffer at any pH you like. Uh, that means you could have an acidic pH, a basic pH, or a neutral pH. What it means is if you have a buffer, let's say you made a buffer at a pH of 5, when you add acid or base to that buffer that is at a pH of 5, it will be able to maintain pretty much that pH of 5. Will it go up or down? It will go up a little bit and it may go down a little bit depending on what you're adding, but you will not see a tremendous jump in the pH if you add acid or base. So for example, if you had a pH of 5 buffer, and you added acid to it, you will not see the pH go from five all the way down to like one or something like that, a really big jump in pH. Also, if you had a buffer at that five and you added base to it, you would not see the pH jump all the way up to like 13 or something like that. So it's able to resist big changes in pH when you add acid or base to that. And it's really able to do that because it has both of those things in it, a acid part and a base part of the buffer itself. So let's talk about really sort of how a buffer really sort of works here. Let's just take a couple of examples. <clears throat> so let's just say we took just plain old, good old water there. And water is not a buffer. And let's say we took some hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, and we added it to water. When we would add it to water, what would happen is 100% of it would break apart into H plus and Cl minus. And in that particular case, we have just added a lot of free H plus. And that is definitely going to affect the pH because the pH is minus the log of the H plus. And when the H plus concentration increases, we would expect the pH to decrease. So here, if we had, say, the pH of water, and we'll call it five or six, whatever it may be, um, and we add some HCl to it, we would expect perhaps to see the pH of that water go from a pH of five, six, down to a, say a pH of two or one, a pretty big jump in the pH. Again, because we're adding a lot of free H plus very quickly, going to really increase that H plus concentration and cause the pH basically to go pretty far down. Now, what would happen if we added sodium hydroxide to our water? Sodium hydroxide, also a strong base, going to 100% break apart into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. So here in this particular case, we are not producing H plus ions because it's a base. We are though producing a lot of free OH minus. So a lot of free OH minus here. And that's important because if you remember, there is a relationship that as the OH minus concentration increases, we would expect the H plus concentration to decrease and we would expect the pH to go up in this case. So because we are generating a lot of OH minus, we are essentially decreasing the H plus in that solution and the OH minus is getting larger, the pH will go up. So again here, if we added this sodium hydroxide to our water that started say in the 5.6 range or something like that, uh, we would perhaps expect to see it to jump to a pH of 8, 9, 10, depending on how much, obviously, you added and stuff like that. So because water is not a buffer, it has no way to handle this H plus that's being come in when you add the acid, uh, the influx of OH minus when you add the base. So let's see what would happen, though, if we added these same two things 
to an actual buffer. So let's take a look at a buffer. So let's say we had a buffer of acetic acid, it's your classic buffer example, and sodium acetate. So in case you're not sure, acetic acid is a weak acid. And sodium acetate is the salt of this conjugate base. What makes it a salt? It has the sodium there. Yeah. The sodium here is really not doing anything. It is actually the acetate part. That's the important part of the buffer. But the sodium is there to balance out the charge. So again, that's why sometimes it's referred to as the salt of this conjugate base because it has that extra Na plus there to balance out the charge. Really a spectator ion, not really doing much in terms of any type of reaction. So let's see what happens when we take our same HCl. So when we take our HCl in this case and add it to our buffer, HCl is an acid. And when we think about our buffer, as you can see here, there really is an acid part to the buffer and there really is a base part to the buffer. So when you add an acid to a buffer, the acid is going to react with the base part of the buffer, right? They're called acid-base reactions, not acid-acid reactions, right? So the reaction that you get is the HCl will react with the sodium acetate, which is the base part of the buffer. And basically what you're gonna get here is a double displacement reaction. Basically our two positive guys are gonna switch partners and you will end up with acetic acid So again, basically these two guys are switching partners and you will end up uh, with some sodium chloride here as your products. So when the buffer reacts with the acid, this is the reaction that we would expect to happen. So let's take a look at a couple of things. First off, what we see is on the product side, we actually created more acetic acid. So acetic acid was part of the buffer to begin with. We actually just created more of it, which means that is not going to obviously affect the pH. The other thing that we produced is the salt, sodium chloride. And from our conversation about salts, we know that this salt, hopefully you know, is a neutral salt. It is sodium, right? That is neutral. It is Cl that came from HCl, which means it's relatively weak and it is a neutral salt. So that is not going to affect the pH at all. But more importantly, what we do not see on the product side here, we do not see that we do see when we added the acid to water is when we added the acid to water, we made a bunch of free H plus. When we added that acid to the buffer, we did not make any free H plus. Because we did not make any free H plus, we didn't make any free H plus, not made. That means that the concentration of H plus should remain relatively constant. And that also means that the pH, which relies on the H plus concentration, should also remain relatively constant as well. So because this buffer was able to react with the acid and essentially tie up the H plus that normally would be in the solution, it allows the overall H plus concentration to remain constant or pretty constant. And again, by doing so, it also prevents the pH from moving because overall H plus is still about where it was at to start with. So the pH will stay where it's at to start with. 
question on the acid part here. By the way, the uh, pH, if you were actually monitoring this, it would go down, but it wouldn't go down tremendously. So say you started at like a pH of 4.74, maybe it went down to like a pH of 4.6 or something like that. A very small sort of adjustment you will see, but again, you won't see a tremendous drop in the pH. It won't go from like 4.74 to like a pH of one, so you won't get that big jump. And that's again because the H plus concentration is remaining relatively constant. It's not perfectly constant, which is why I say relatively constant. And that's also why you will see a slight decrease in the pH, but you shouldn't see a tremendous jump in the pH. The other important thing that we oftentimes always see in buffer situations is what we see here. We do produce the other part of the buffer as a result of this reaction. Any questions on the acid reaction there? Okay, so let's talk about what happens then if we did the base to the same buffer. So I'm going to add my sodium hydroxide. to this same buffer solution we've been talking about. But something different is going to happen here. Since I am adding sodium hydroxide, which is a base, again, it's going to react with the acid part of the buffer. So again, you get that acid-base reaction that's going to occur. So when I dump my sodium hydroxide into a beaker that contains a buffer of acetic acid and sodium acetate, the sodium hydroxide will react with the acetic acid here. And what we're going to get is just a simple acid-base reaction that's going to occur here. And that basically means that we will produce, and this is again a double displacement where these two guys are switching partners. We're going to get sodium acetate and some H2O, a salt and water, which should be a familiar result here of this reaction. So let's take a look now at what we got going on our product side. So just like we saw with the acid reaction, we have actually generated some more of the buffer. So we've generated some more of the sodium acetate that was part of the buffer to begin with. So that is definitely not going to affect the pH. The other thing that we generated in this reaction is some water, which technically is neutral. So that should not affect the pH. And again, the important thing that we actually do not see here, like we see up when we added the base to water is, when we added the base to water, we produced a lot of OH minus, free OH minus. We do not produce any free OH minus here in the buffer reaction. So we do not see any free OH minus. So the same logic here applies that if the OH minus concentration is relatively constant, because the OH minus and H plus concentrations are tied together as one goes up, the other goes down. If our OH minus is constant, that means that our H plus concentration should also be relatively constant. And if our H plus concentration is relatively constant, that should mean that our pH remains relatively constant. So, when we add a base to a buffer, again, because a buffer has an acid part and a base part, it is able to, again, um, tie up all the free OH minus that would normally go into that solution. And because it's able to tie up that OH minus, in this case, in the form of water, we are preventing the OH minus concentration from increasing and also preventing the H plus concentration from going down and also preventing the pH from making a big jump. Again here, just like the acid part, if you added some 
face to a buffer and you were monitoring the pH with a pH meter, you would see probably the pH go up a little bit. But again, you would not see a tremendous jump in the pH from say a pH of four to like a pH of nine or something like that. You'll see this relatively sort of small increase upwards. So ultimately, this is how a buffer works. And the reason it's able to work this way is because it has both of those components in there to begin with. It has an acid part and it has a base part. And that means that when you add either an acid or a base to a buffer, it is able basically to react with it and ultimately prevent the formation of free H plus like you would have when you add an acid or free OH minus like you would have when you add a base question on how a buffer actually works. So, and that's what we were just talking about. Why does a buffer have to be made up of a weak acid or a weak base? Why can we not have a buffer that is made up of, say, a strong acid like this? acetic acid, like hydrochloric acid here. Why can't we perhaps have a buffer that's made up of HCl and say sodium chloride, right? So this would be like an acid and a base. The reason we cannot have a buffer that is made up of this is when we put those into solution, the sodium chloride will break apart into sodium and chloride. It's a strong electrolyte. And the HCl will also break apart into H plus and Cl minus. So you have nothing in that solution that can set up an equilibrium to actually maintain both an acid and a base in that solution. If you dumped all that in, you pretty much would have just like uh, alphabet soup. You would have all these guys here. You would have no acid that's basically maintaining in that solution. You just have a bunch of ions. So it would not be an effective way or an effective buffer in that case. So that is why we cannot have a buffer that is made up of a strong acid or strong base because you really won't have anything that set up, sets up that equilibrium, which is really important to allowing a buffer to work correctly for a long period of time. Um, so two things on that. You cannot have a buffer that is made up of a strong acid or strong base. They do need to be weak. A side note to that is you can actually make a buffer from a strong acid or strong base and the reaction uh, with either a weak acid or weak base. But the idea is you do not have the buffer until all that strong acid and strong base is gone. So we'll kind of see that happen a little bit later on in this chapter, but you can actually make a buffer that way by doing a reaction that involves a strong acid and strong base. But those strong acid and strong base are not the actual buffer. The end result of that reaction is the buffer that you end up with. So um, it is possible to do that. So kind of like uh, what I'm talking about is, um, so we'll go back here. something here. So for example, if you took something like, uh, you know, if you took something like acetic acid and you react it with sodium hydroxide, you will get sodium acetate like we just saw there and some water. This right here, the reaction of these two things are not the buffer. But if you do it in a proper way where you use up all of this and this is no longer there at the end and the only things that are left is acetic acid and sodium acetate, then you have just made a buffer, those two guys. So, you know, there's a way that you could kind of do a reaction, but the reaction itself is not the buffer. The results of the reaction is actually the buffer. And we'll kind of see that. We see that happen a lot also sometimes in titrations that we'll talk about that occurs sometimes. So ultimately when we talk about a buffer, it ultimately sort of works this way, right? So if we have a buffer,
we'll say this is our buffer here. And our buffer basically has an acid part and it has a base part. And when we add acid to our buffer, the acid and the base will react, which means the base part will get smaller. But as we saw, what will happen is, my exaggerated drawing here, the acid part of the buffer will get bigger, the base part of the buffer will get smaller. Same thing happens if we add base to our buffer. As we saw with those reactions, when we add the base, it will react with the acid part of the buffer and use up some of it, but it will also make the base part of the buffer. So what will happen is the base part of the buffer will get larger and the acid part will get smaller. And this is why really sort of buffers can work for a really good period of time, you know, if you make sort of a correct buffer, because, you know, as you use up a little bit of one, you're kind of making the other and vice versa, you know. So it's able to sort of regenerate a little bit as it's doing some of the reaction and allow it to sort of keep the pH uh, relatively constant for a good period of time, even if you're answering or adding a lot of stuff. Now there is a limit to buffer. There's something known as buffer capacity, uh, which means, you know, you could screw it up, you know? So for example, let's just say here, you didn't read the instructions and you decided, hey, I'll grab the 18 molar acid off the shelf instead of say the 0.1 molar acid. That's not a big deal. So let's just say you added some acid that is way too concentrated to your buffer. And let's just say you jumped in there and decided, hey, I'm just going to add a bunch of, say, 18 molar acid to it, really strong acid. What that's going to do is essentially just blow right through the base part of the buffer. And you basically will use up all the base part of the buffer because your buffer really only has so many moles of base to react with. And if you add a lot of moles of acid, the base becomes in the buffer the limiting reagent, and it gets used up and you would see a pretty big jump in the pH in that case. Or if you just keep adding acid, right? If you just keep adding acid, eventually what's gonna to happen to your buffer is pretty much all of your buffer will end up being the acid part left and maybe you got a little bit of that base part left until at some point you keep adding and you use it all up at that point, you have no more base part of the buffer available to you to react with any more acid that you're adding. So if you just keep adding acid and adding acid and adding acid, especially if you add more concentrated acid and stuff like that, at some point you're going to turn your base part of your buffer into like the limiting reagent and it's going to get used up. And once it gets used up, at that point, if you keep adding acid, you're basically just dumping into that solution a bunch of H+, which you then would expect the pH to go way down. And you will see a big jump in the pH. Same thing on the other end, if you add base and you keep adding base, eventually the acid part of your buffer there, again, will become like the limiting reagent. And it eventually will get all used up. And at some point, once you get to that point where you use up all of the acid part of the buffer, you then will be, when you add that base to it, adding a bunch of OH minuses. And at that point, you're going to increase the amount of OH minus. You're going to decrease the amount of H plus, and you would expect the pH to go up in that case. So there is something known as a buffer capacity. Uh, a buffer needs to be made up of a weak acid and conjugate base or a weak base and conjugate acid of the right molarity because when it's the correct molarity for your application, that means it has a correct number of moles of the acid part and base part to react with 
whatever you're going to add to it, more acid or base. Um, otherwise you will see, you know, a big jump in your buffer really won't work really well. Question on that there. <clears throat> And lastly here in terms of sort of buffers and stuff, how do we know, you know, how to make a buffer or a good buffer, right? How can we choose something that would be a, a good buffer to make in this situation? Well, we actually can use Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to help us understand that. If we look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which is typically the equation that is used for buffers, and I got a log in there, there we go. The pH equals pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. So if you make a buffer that has equal concentration of the base over the acid, so if you make a buffer with equal concentrations of the acid and base, that means when you get to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, you will end up with the pH equals to pKa plus the log of one. Log of one equals zero, which means you end up with this relationship here that the pH equals the pKa value. So usually what you wanna do is the pH is equal to plus or minus one of the pKa value. And that usually is a very good way to choose what weak acid, what weak base would be a good buffer to make based on the pH that you're trying to do. So for example, you know, if I wanted to make a buffer at a pH of let's say nine, and I go, I'm just gonna go with acetic acid because you know I hear about acetic acid a lot with buffers, I'm gonna use that in sodium acetate. When I look at the pKa value for acetic acid, it is 4.74. That is pretty far away from a pH of nine. Could you get it to work? Maybe. Will it be effective? Probably not as effective as it perhaps should be. So this would probably not be your best bet to make a buffer at a pH of nine. Perhaps if you use something like NH3, right, which is ammonia, has a pKb value, and when you get to its pKa value, it's got a pKa value like 9.25. Now that is much, much closer to our goal of nine. This guy here, along with maybe some ammonium chloride, weak base, and conjugate acid. Um, that would be a very good choice here to make this buffer out of, and it would probably work a lot better. So when you're trying to choose, hey, you know, what should I make my buffer out of? You want to first think about the pH you're trying to make it, and you want to think about, you know, how close that pKa value is to that desired pH. And usually within about one is a pretty good area where you could kind of make it work pretty good. As close as you could get it is probably better because the farther you are away uh, in terms of pH and pKa value, the more you have to add and more of one component versus the other you got to add. And at the end, it's, it's really not going to give you a pretty good amount of each of those parts of the buffer to begin with. And it's not going to probably be an effective buffer over a long period of time. Or you're going to have to use a lot of one reagent versus the other question on how to choose the right buffer here. Okay. So here's a, a picture of kind of what we've been talking about. And as you can see, in terms of the pH of a buffer solution, which is sort of the middle line there that goes straight, we do see a, a relatively maintained pH. And as I mentioned before, even if you do have a buffer and you're adding acid or base to it, it won't stick at that pH. It will move up or down depending on sort of what you're adding. If you're adding some base to a buffer, you will see the pH go up a little bit. Again, not tremendous, but you will see it go up and start creeping up a little bit. 
And if you add acid to a buffer, you will see the pH kind of go down a little bit. But again, not a big jump in pH, relatively maintained. And that's very different than water here. As you can see, water started around seven and you know, you added just a little bit of some acid here and we had a pretty big jump already from seven down to two. And we see a pretty big jump in the pH. Thus, obviously water, as we talked about, is not an acid. When you add either an acid or base to it, you're just generating a lot of free H plus or OH minus really quickly. All right, so let's take a, whoops. Let's take a look at each of these here and decide whether or not these guys would be a good buffer system. So take a minute or two, take a look at each of these sort of pairs and decide would these guys be a buffer or not such a good buffer. Okay, uh, so let's take a look. So remember, in order uh, for this to be a buffer, we're really looking for one of two combinations, either a weak acid and its conjugate base, or the salt of its conjugate base, or we're looking for a weak base and the salt of its conjugate acid. So those are the two things that we're kind of looking for here. In order for those things to be related to each other, Again, you could just use that basic definition of Bronsted Lowry, which is that just needs to really be a difference of one H plus. So when we look at these two things, KF is really K plus and F minus. Uh, so really when we look at these two guys, that is a difference of just one H plus. Again, the K here makes it a salt. Also spectator ion, not really important. So these two things are related to each other. And so then what you have to decide is this guy here, which is the acid, is it a strong or weak acid? And in the case of HF, it is a weak acid. So this would be our weak acid. And we have a conjugate base over here. So this A would be a buffer system questions on A. Okay, so kind of applying the same logic here to our second one, HBr and like KBr. Again, our KBr is really uh, K plus and Br minus. So again, if we look at this relationship here, they are uh, related to each other by one H plus difference. Again, the K plus here is just a spectator ion. So when we look at this, which is HBr, that is hydrobromic acid. And hopefully you remember from our conversation a couple of days ago, hydrobromic acid is a strong acid. So because this is a strong acid, this will not be a buffer. Again, you cannot have a buffer that is made up of a strong acid or a strong base. So B would not be a buffer, even though they are related to each other. And lastly here, uh, we got some really 
NaHCO3 and Na2CO3. In this case, we actually got a couple of things here. We have Na plus and HCO3 minus, and we got a couple of these guys and CO3 two minus. So if we get rid of all the sodiums, which are really just kind of spectators around here, um, we could look at the two things that are perhaps related to each other. And we do see that the only difference between these two guys is one H plus. So they are related to each other. You may also recognize this guy as coming from carbonic acid. This is the second step in that carbonic acid dissociation. This polyprotic acid. And that would probably make it a weak acid and its conjugate base. So this would be a buffer as well. Question on identifying buffers. Again, a reminder that and they do need to be weak acid or base and their partners in order for them to be a buffer. Is if you see something that is a strong acid or base and being asked, is it a buffer? Again, the answer is gonna be no because the strong acid or base will not be able to set up that equilibrium. Any questions on that there? Okay, so let's take a look at maybe some calculations here that involve buffers. So we got a couple here. Uh, calculate the pH of a buffer system that contains one molar acetic acid and one molar sodium acetate. And I tell you what, just start with part A first and then we'll talk about part B together. Uh, so take a couple minutes here and calculate the pH of part A. Ka value of acetic acids on the bottom there. 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So take a minute or two here and come up with the pH of our acetic acid and sodium acetate buffer solution in part A.
Okay, so uh, let's take a look at part A. So in part A, they were nice enough to tell you it's a buffer, which they won't always. Uh, but if they didn't, you can look at acetic acid and sodium acetate and hopefully uh, recognize that it is a buffer, that those two things are related to each other. You'll also hopefully recognize that this is a weak acid because you see a Ka value. So that automatically tells you that it is a weak acid. So all those things put together should tell you that you're in a buffer situation and probably the best thing to do would be the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation um, because you could go right into that pH equals to pKa value plus the log of the base over the acid. So that's what we're gonna do here for part A. We're gonna go right into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation because we can recognize it as a buffer. And that means that we do need the pKa value. So the pKa value will equal minus the log of the Ka value. And that is minus the log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. That is gonna give us a pKa value of 4.74. At this point, we would go into our Henderson-Hasselbalch, the pH would equal 4.74 plus the log and in this case, the concentration of the base is one and the acid is one. And again, a reminder that this is our acid and this guy here with the sodium is our base, right? In this case, they both happen to be one, so uh, no problem either way. That's gonna give us basically the log of one, which is zero, which means in this case, the pH of our opening guy here is 4.74. Four. Question on that part. Now, as we uh, sort of talked about last time, if you don't want to use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, you could have done it as an ice table and a Ka problem. And just to kind of again show you what that would look like, you would use the acetic acid as that's the only thing that's going to set up the equilibrium. And initially, we do have one molar of this guy, zero this guy. And again, the important part here is from that sodium acetate, we also have one molar here. So if you do the ice table approach, perfectly okay to do. The important part is you should have numbers on both sides of the ice table and commonly missed is the guy on the right hand there. People put zero. It's going to be minus x uh, plus x plus x and at equilibrium one minus x x one actually plus x here this would go into your ka expression of your you would have x times one plus x divided by one minus x equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus five i won't finish it but uh, you basically solve for x when you do, X will equal the H plus concentration. And when it's all said and done and you get yourself to the pH, you will end up with the same answer or you should end up with the same answer. So again, it, it really is your call if you're more comfortable doing the ice table and are afraid that you're going to use Henderson Hasselbalch in the wrong situation, you could still do the ice table. Can't remember the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, which I can't imagine that being the case in this class at that point. Um, you could still always try the ice table and sort of do it. Any questions on either part of that? Obviously, you don't have to do it both ways. You could choose one way, yes. Again, as you can see, probably in the scheme of sort of working out the problem, the Henderson Hasselbalch probably gonna be a quicker way of doing it and we'll give you your answer and probably recommend it, I would say. Again, as long as you are sure you're using it in the correct situation. All right, so let's talk then about uh, part B and what's going on in part B of this problem, which is an important sort of concept here with buffers. So let's take a look at part B. And in part B, we're using the same buffer, um, but, to this buffer, we're going to add some acid to it. 
And for the sake of argument for this problem, we're going to assume that everything just remains at one liter. So the volume doesn't necessarily change. But it won't always be that case, but you know, it normally um, will change, but we're just going to make it a little bit easier on this first calculation here. But let's just talk in general what happens, say, if we have a solution and we add, you know, another solution to it. So when we add another solution to it, does the molarity stay the same? And the answer hopefully that you are saying to yourself is no. Because when we look at molarity, the moles of the solute, right? Divided by liters of solution. So when we add more volume to a solution, we are actually increasing the bottom part here, which means the molarity is constantly changing as we add more solution to it or water or whatever you may be adding to it. The thing that does not change is the top part, the moles of the solute. The moles of solute remain the same unless you put more in, but it remains the same regardless of what you add in it. And that's the case with a buffer. So as I was talking about previously, when you make a buffer, there really is so many moles of your acid in there and so many moles of your base in there available to react. And regardless of what you add in there, unless you add more of those acid or, or base from your buffer into that solution, it's going to only have a certain amount. So the moles remain the same, which means whenever we're dealing with a situation where we are adding more volume to a solution and a reaction, like in part B here, where we have a buffer, we're gonna dump some more acid in there, or base in there. We cannot deal with molarity. We need to deal with moles. So what this affects is we do need to do an ice table whenever we add solution to another. But instead of doing the ice table in molarity, we actually need to do the ice table in moles as that does not change. So the main difference is we do the ice table in moles. When it's done, we then can convert those moles back to molarity at the end of the first ice table. So let us take a look at part B and, and sort of see how this works. So in part B, we have our one molar acetic acid and one molar sodium acetate buffer. And to that buffer, we're going to add 0 0.1 molar HCl. Now, in this particular case, like I said, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to keep the volume constant. So we're going to keep the volume constant at one liter for everybody. So we're just going to assume everybody has one liter just to keep it constant. Not always the case, so you do have to kind of come in, take into account the volume. We'll talk about that in just a second. But let's first talk about the reaction that's going to happen. When I add that HCl, it is an acid, and it's going to react with, as we talked about earlier, the base part of the buffer. So it's going to react with the sodium acetate here. And what we will end up with is, uh, we're gonna end up with, we're gonna end up with here some acetic acid and some sodium chloride, right? So when we do this reaction, what we wanna do is have our initial amount. Now, because we're adding, we want to, do this ice table in moles. So because it's one liter, that means if I take one liter times 0.1 molar, that gives me 0.1 moles. Right? And in this particular case, 
we have sodium acetate, which is part of our buffer. And we have one liter of that, which means I have one mole of that guy. And also really important because this is a buffer, we also have acetic acid present in there. That also is gonna be one mole. So this is sort of what our ice table will look like. Also different here is because this is a buffer, we should know what's going to happen. We should know that the HCl that we are adding is basically the limiting reagent. It should be used up. So also different here is we're not going to use excess. Because we know what's going to happen here, we know that the HCl in this case is going to get used up. So we're actually gonna use a number here. It's gonna be minus 0 0.1, minus 0 0.1, and it would be plus 0 0.1 moles on the back end. So because we know it's a buffer, because we know that the HCl should be the limiting reagent, we're going to actually use a number for the change part. So we're not gonna use X's. We already know what X is. It's going to be all of the HCl should get used up. When that happens, just like we would expect, all of the HCl should get used up. We will be left with 0 0.9 moles of our sodium acetate, and we will be adding on the right-hand side 1.1 moles of our acetic acid. First off, any question on the ice table here? You may also have noticed that I did not do anything over here with my sodium chloride. That is because this is a neutral salt. So I find it's really a good idea not to put numbers on something you don't really need because you might be tempted to use it somewhere in the calculation. Now, Typically in this situation, when you're adding volume and you do this first ice table in moles, at this point, it is very good practice to convert this back to molarity. And in this case, since we're keeping the volume at one liter, we would divide everybody by one liter, which would give us 0.9 molar. We will divide everybody by one liter here, and that will give us 1.1 molar. So now if you get to this point in the calculation and you look at the paper and go, I'm not really sure what's going on at this point, your ice table can help you out here. If we look at the ice table, we essentially only have this guy left over, our sodium acetate, and we have this guy here left over, which is our acetic acid. And hopefully you could recognize again that this is a weak acid and it's conjugate base, which means what we are left with at equilibrium is a buffer. So we are still left with a buffer at equilibrium, the same buffer we started with basically, yes. And if you could recognize that that is a buffer, that means that if you want the pH, you can go right into your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And since it is the same weak acid, we will have the same pKa value from before, which is our 4.74, plus the log. And again, here we want to get our base up on top, which is our sodium acetate, 0 0.9 divided by 1.1. And that will give you 0.9 divided by 1.1. We're going to take the log of it. We're going to add it to 4.74. It's going to give us something like 4.65, maybe, I think I have. What do I have there? 4.65 in that ballpark. And that would be our pH after we added our HCl to it. Now, again, if you did not want to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation at this point, instead of this, you could have set up a second ice table, again, using the weak acid as your equation. 
And what you would have done is initially you would take your equilibrium line and it becomes your initial line. So initially you would have 1.1 molar, 0, 0 0.9. Change would be minus x plus x plus x. Equilibrium 1.1 minus x, x 0 0.9 plus x. Again, solve for x and then get to your pH, which again should bring you back to kind of the same idea. So again, you do have a couple of options as to how to do that. Question on that there. So if you remember, we talked about, does this stuff make sense? So let's talk about, does it make sense based on what we did? This here was our pH of the buffer by itself. It started at 4.74. We then added acid to it, which means because we're adding acid, we would expect the pH to go down, and it did, but it did not go down very far. It went down to 4.65. So that's still kind of maintaining where it started at 4.7, and it went down a little bit to 4.65. But more importantly in these calculations, you saw it go down in the correct direction. So since you added an acid, it went down. If you did this calculation, you ended up with a pH of like 4.9. That is wrong because that's going in the wrong direction, right? You should not go up if you had an acid in terms of the pH. So these are ways that you can kind of check yourself as you're doing these calculations and make sure that you are doing them sort of correctly or that at least your answer makes sense uh, when you get it. Question on that there. All right, then you try one here. We're looking for two answers. We wanna know uh, what is the pH at the beginning and what is it after we add uh, some sodium hydroxide to it? Here, we are not keeping the volume constant, so you do need to take that into account. So take a few minutes here and see what you come up with and let me give you, um, let me give you a Ka value here, which I think you might need, and that would be the uh, Ka value for NH4 plus is uh, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. So see what you come up with. So again, two answers, what the pH is at the beginning and what is the pH when it's all said and done after you add the sodium hydroxide.
Okay, so since we're getting to uh, sort of the end here, let's take a look and see how we're at least doing here. Make sure everybody's on hopefully the right track. All right, so first off, obviously, it, it tells us it's a buffer. If it didn't tell us a buffer, hopefully you should be able to recognize that these two guys are related to each other. NH3 is a weak base. NH4 plus is its conjugate acid. Um, so this is a buffer. So as soon as you see it's a buffer here, for the first part of the question is, what is the pH of that buffer? Uh, so we do need the pKa value, and we could go right into our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation afterwards. So minus the log of our 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10, and that will give us a pKa value of 9.25. At this point, like I said, because we do recognize it as a buffer, we could go right into here. You do have that ice table option. If you wanted to do that, you could do that as well. But I'm just going to go into here. So that's going to give us 9.25 plus the log. Again, here we want to make sure we get our base. So NH3 is our base. Also, this was the Ka value for NH4 plus. So that should tell you that's the acid. Uh, so we're going to go with uh, 0.3 on top and 0.36 on the bottom going to give us an opening pH of this buffer of 9.17, it looks like. This is a basic buffer, and you can see that you do get, you know, an okay answer here using the henderson Oswald equation. Question on part A here, our first part of it. Now, the second part of it is we want to know what the pH of this buffer is going to be once we add some sodium hydroxide to this buffer solution. So we do need to start with a reaction, and that reaction is going to be our sodium hydroxide, which is a base. So when it reacts with our buffer, which is up here, it is going to react with the acid part of the buffer, which is our NH4 plus, really. The Cl is actually just a spectator on here. It is neutral, not really doing much, but we'll leave it in. So you're actually going to get this reaction here. And uh, what you're going to end up with is, uh, again, this is going to act as the acid. So that is going to make NH3. It always makes the other part of the buffer. When it makes NH3, it's going to also make a little bit of water. It's also going to make a little bit of sodium chloride as well. Again, the H plus is going to go over here to the hydroxide. And that's where your water comes from. This becomes NH3 and the Cl minus and the Na plus come together. Got a lot going on in this reaction. Not all of it really important. But what is important here is we are adding sodium hydroxide, which means we are adding volume to our buffer, which means that we need to do our ice table in moles. So because we are adding our volume here, we need to do this ice table in moles. It means we need to figure out the moles of everybody going on here. So starting with our sodium hydroxide, we're going to take our volume and convert it into liters. We're going to times it by the molarity of it, 0 0.05 moles per liter. And that will give us uh, 0 0.02 times 0 0.05, 0 0.001 moles as our starting amount here. Again, these are moles because we're adding volume. We also have 80 milliliters of the buffer. So we're going to figure out the concentration of our NH4. Not really concentration, it's actually moles on both of these. Our moles would be uh, 0 0.08 liters, which is the volume of the buffer times the molarity of our NH4, which is 0.36 moles per liter. 0 0.08 times 0 0.36, 0 0.029 moles, we'll call it. 0 0.029 moles. 
of this guy. Doing the same calculation, remember it's a buffer, so we also have NH3. So 0 0.08 times 0 0.3 gives us 0 0.024 moles. I am not gonna worry about anybody on this side because they're not gonna do anything that's water and it's sodium chloride, which will have no effect on the pH. A reminder that what we are talking about is a buffer that is 80 milliliters and it has both NH4 plus floating around and NH3 in there. And that is why we would use 0 0.08 times 0 0.3 to get our value on the product side. Question on those numbers, where we got those numbers from. All right, so since it is a buffer, we're going to... Uh, know what the change is here. It should use up all of our sodium hydroxide. So it's gonna be minus 0 0.001. By the way, it's the smaller number here. You cannot subtract the larger, you get a negative value. Minus 0 0.001 and plus 0 0.001. That is going to give me at equilibrium. All of my sodium hydroxide moles should be used up. In terms of my NH4, I have 0.028 moles. And in terms of my NH3, I'm going to add that to it. And that's going to give me 0 0.025 moles. Again, make sure that you do add on the back end there. Now, once I have done this ice table in moles, again, assuming that my sodium hydroxide here is my limiting reagent, since it is a smaller number, you should, and it is very good practice, to convert back to molarity at this point. How do I convert back to molarity? You're going to need to divide by the total volume. Remember that we started with 80 milliliters of the buffer. We just added 20 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide, that gives us a grand total of our volume at this point of 100 milliliters. That means that we should divide this not by 100 milliliters, but by 0.1 liters. That will be giving us back molarity at this point. And if I do that, 0 0.028 divided by 0.1 gives me 0 0.28 molar and this will give me 0 0.25 molar when I divide that back. Any questions at that point? So again, okay. yeah, good question. Okay, um, no, earlier, uh, I, I'm not sure how you got the molarity for, uh, I mean, the moles for um, uh, NH3. Uh, same calculation as this one, basically. So it would be, 0 0.08 liters, which is the 80 milliliters, times the molarity of the NH3, which is 0 0.3 per liter. And that's how you get that number. So it's volume times molarity. And because they are both uh, the buffers in that solution to begin with, the 80 milliliters, the volume of both the acid and the base in that case question on that um so is it almost multiplied by 0 0.08 mil, uh, 0 0.08 liters uh, uh in this case it is because it said we had 80 milliliters of the buffer so that's how much buffer we had to start with so that's the volume of both parts of the buffer the in this case the ammonia and the ammonium chloride So not in every problem will obviously be 80, but in this particular case, it's the volume of the buffer. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So once we have it back to uh, molarity here, if you're not sure sort of what you got going on, you can look at your ice table to help you. You can see that you have ammonium chloride and you have ammonia left. And hopefully, again, you can recognize that these two things are still a buffer. 
So what you have left at equilibrium is still a buffer, which means you once again can go back into your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And it's going to be the same pKa value because it's the same buffer. We will go with the log of the base, which again is our 0.25 divided by our 0.28. And that gives us something like, I believe, a pH of 9.20 in this particular case. Just to make sure. And that would be the pH um, that you would have after you added the sodium hydroxide to it. And we could see, does it make sense? Well, we started at 9.17, we added some base. It didn't go up very much, but we wouldn't expect it to do so because it's a buffer, but it did go in the right direction. We added base, so the pH went up. So that does make sense in terms of that. Alternatively as well, again, here at the end, if you did not want to uh, go into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, you could do another ice table to get the same answer. And lastly, I will say that this is a kind of an important step here. You should convert back to molarity. I'll be honest with you, if you use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation with the moles, you will get the same answer because of the math. But there's a lot of places later on that we'll talk about where you do need molarity and you won't get the right answer. So usually pretty good practice to convert back to molarity after you do that first ice table in moles. And then you usually have the number in the correct sort of units. Um, I will say though, you can go into the Henderson Hasselbach with moles, it will work out okay. Um, but um, you do wanna probably convert to molarity uh, in most cases. Question on that there. Again, this is a, a good example of a basic buffer. And again, we can see that uh, you can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. You could have used that POH version of the equation and kind of work backwards, but uh, it gets you to here uh, using the Henderson-Hasselbalch. So I would just use this one. Any questions on any part of that calculation there? Okay, so uh, we are going to uh, stop lecturing here we are going to have a quiz, I think. We'll have a quiz next Tuesday on this chapter up through what we talked about today. So up through buffers, uh, we'll do the quiz on next Tuesday. So uh, I think we'll probably do it. That's the start of lab next Tuesday. Um, but uh, it will cover this chapter through what we talked about today, which I guess is through buffers. So we've got a little bit more to go in this chapter after buffers. We've got titration still to go. Uh, and then we'll almost be done with this chapter. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, so uh, for lab today, we're gonna to talk about uh, part two of the experiment. And uh, since we went a little bit long here, why don't we start lab at, uh, why don't we start lab at like a quarter to 12. So we'll start at 11.45, give everybody a chance to kind of get up and stretch. And we'll start lab at that point. If you didn't put it here, make sure you do so. And again, I'll see everybody at about 11.45 there in lab.